From the European Parliament in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight. And this is what we have for you on the program. A spits and split ahead of the EU summit. French and German leaders disagree on how to choose a commission president. Kurt Skibosch, what's next for the Austrian chancellor after he and his government are booted from power? Political influencers, why Germany's AKK is taking aim at young YouTubers with persuasive political views. From bad to worse, first poor election results, now prison for Romania's most powerful politician. And power pair, Greta Thunberg teams up with Arnold Schwarzenegger in tonight's Raw Moment. Good evening to you. It is now time to meet our panelists uh, tonight. Florian Eder, he's the author of Brussels Playbook at Politico Europe. Uh, we read it every day. So, Florian, what story are you watching uh, tonight? Well, of course, I need to watch the Spitzen thing, but the Austrian story is extraordinary, so uh, I go for that. Very interesting drama there, indeed. Okay, also joining us, Christina Berzina. She's a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund. What about you, Christine? I'm looking at the future of Europe. So the summit tonight and what happens next? Who's going to be leading and uh, what, what does the future hold? Seems like the big umbrella topic, the future of <laughs> Europe. Okay, and also joining us, Andrew Duff. He's a former MEP and president of the Spinelli Group. What about you, Andrew? Well, the Spitzner candidate, it's power of politics. And so it's uh, the most important question in town this week. Absolutely. Power play and power politics. That's exactly where we're beginning tonight because with the fight for Europe's uh, top jobs, that's, that includes the most important of all, the European Commission President Post. Now, likely to last months, the haggling begins in earnest tonight over a dinner with European leaders at the EU summit in a very different political reality. Now, earlier today, the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, she arrived on the red carpet uh, in Brussels along with with the French President Emmanuel Macron and the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, fresh off election gains back home. But it is this man, which you will see there, Manfred Weber. He's expected to be the focus of the debate this evening. There he is. Now, despite some significant losses, his EPP group still won the most seats in the EU elections <coughs> this week. All right. Now, under the Spitzen candidate process, uh, that puts uh, Mr. Weber in the lead position to become commission president. But tonight, there are doubts about just how committed some European leaders are to that process. Well, for more on this, let's head to the European Council and our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Uh, so, Darren, so can you tell us, uh, there's so much talk behind this, how, who is going to get the top job? So t tell us about the forces that are trying to, 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 to head this. Well, as Fran Timmermans uh, put it, uh, Tessa, let Game of Thrones uh, begin. The proper power struggle here in Brussels. Post those election results to decide uh, who will take over a whole range of Europe's uh, top jobs, most notably uh, the Commission uh, job. And in that, there are different forces at play and a proper tussle between the European Parliament and, indeed, uh, the Council and, of course, inside the Council itself. Now, it is clear uh, this afternoon uh, the Council issued a letter in which they reiterated uh, that they do want this lead process, the so-called Spitzen candidate process, to remain in place. They do believe uh, that whoever the next Commission President is should come within the ranks. Uh, many, of course, would argue, given how fragmented that Parliament now is, how uh, no party, not even the two largest parties, have any sort of majority, that that case is somewhat weakened. And, of course, uh, people would point out uh, that the council has a key role in all of this, the most key role. They propose who they think should be the next commission president. It then has to be approved by the parliament. But inside the council itself, there is a tussle uh, as well, not least of all on the Franco-German axis between Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron. We know that Mrs Merkel and the EPP have been pushing Manfred Weber, uh, their lead candidate, very, very strongly. Ultimately, he is from their grouping. He is also German. Uh, maybe not a surprise that Angela Merkel would like him to see him take the top job here in Brussels. But uh, Emmanuel Macron is not on side of that. Not least of all because he doesn't want this thing to turn into the EPP naturally taking over at every single election the commission job if they remain the largest party. And in addition to that, 
does he want another German in the top job? Possibly not. And that is why there are compromise candidates being talked about, uh, like the competition commissioner, uh, Margarita Vescada, or indeed another Frenchman uh, who's not from the parliament, uh, Michel Barnier, but has been very well respected during those Brexit negotiations. So all in all, uh, we're going to see this play out not just tonight, but indeed over the coming uh, months, even hints and suggestions, Tessa, uh, that Jean-Claude Juncker could stay in his post longer because it could take so long to sort out. It should be said, though, tonight Angela Merkel apparently is insistent that this dinner does not run too late, not into the wee small hours as, we're like, as we've seen with those Brexit uh, council meetings. And Emmanuel Macron, uh, along with Mark Rutter, Rutter has suggested uh, that... Tonight is not a debate about names, but merely a focus on the substance of what the new commission should look like, which has led one EU diplomat to quip, poor Manfred Weber, he hasn't got a programme or indeed a personality, and that is why <laughs> they're having to focus on the next commission and its programme rather than personalities tonight. All right, thank you for that, uh, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, there. All right, uh, let's start with this, you know, the Franco-German axis. I'll, I'll start with you, Florian. A lot of people are looking at this saying, well, you know what, Franco-German spats, this is not new, but this time it could be a little bit dangerous. Do you agree, and, and how dangerous is this for both sides, in fact, in this top job competition? No, I think it could be dangerous. Uh, they will need to be very careful uh, for this institutional fight not to turn into a proper brawl. Uh, over the next month, dragging on for months and months and months, uh, because that would help uh, actually no side and no one. Uh, so, which is why um, Merkel pushed for uh, a solution to be found rather soon, before the summer. So did uh, uh, Council, European Council President Donald Tusk. Um, I think the you know the political will is there uh, to uh, agree on something. It's just looking very very difficult at this moment uh, to find uh, a compromise on who would be. Uh, the Commission President of choice uh, that would have majorities and the chance in both institutions, the European Council and Parliament. Yeah, and as uh, Darren was saying, the rumours are that possibly uh, Jean-Claude Juncker could say, I mean, that's a big deal. In, it means that it just shows just how hard it is to find someone to replace him in this sense. Yes, they could, they, presumably there could be a caretaker commission that leads into the fall and winter, but that's not something that the council wants either. It doesn't show a very smooth transition of power, and it doesn't show competence, really, of any of the institutions. And at this moment, I think in order to harness uh, Europeanness and to take it forward, decisive leadership would be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there's much appetite uh, for the commission president process to look like the process of trying to build a government in Belgium, for example. I don't think we want 500 days of dysfunction. Um, and so instead, I hope that tonight at the summit there is a productive conversation. Yeah, so Andrew, I, I mean, you know, we're talking about uh, this, this, uh, this haggling, but why is it so important for these leaders? Is, it's, is it all about, at the end of it, control over Europe? Is that what it what well, is? Well, I mean... Uh, I think one's got to have a look at it as a parliamentary process. We have had elections, and after elections, the public expect a leader to come out on top. Um, it isn't so clear here because we haven't got a government. We've got a commission and the European Council and so forth. So it's a little bit more uh, op opaque. Mm. Uh, but the essence of the le le leadership is, is important and it's there and mm. everyone can have a look at it. And, and right. I think it's a very uh, transparent uh, process. It's in the treaty, we're exploiting it. And it's a, it's a long process, in TTI, as we were talking well, yeah. about. And we keep, hold on a second, because yeah. we keep talking about, you know, this process, the Spitzen candidate process. Now, Jean-Claude Juncker, he was the first president of the European Commission elected through uh, this uh, process we've been talking about, a long word and equally long procedure. Uh, so let's take a look at just exactly how it works. It all went smoothly in 2014. Instead of being appointed by the heads of state and government, Mr. Juncker was first chosen by his peers, campaigned at the European election, and then approved by the European Council. Known as Spitzenkandidat, meaning lead candidate, the process brought in to try to democratize the position of commission president. With each political group in parliament putting forward a candidate or candidates, the group which wins the most seats at the election has its candidate go forward for approval by Europe's leaders in the council. Council is happy, then that lead candidate would then go on to become president of the commission. 
But this time, it's different. Some of Europe's leaders, including France's Emmanuel Macron, have reportedly raised the prospect of ditching the Spitzenkandidat process altogether and appointing their own candidate. And that would be a bold power play in the ongoing struggle between the European Parliament and the European Council. So that is the process, Florian. Why do you think Emmanuel Macron is just so against this? What is, what is his opposition? I mean, his opposition is probably twofold. One is um, uh, he thinks that the, the European Council should have more of a, an authority and have more of a say over, uh, over all things European. Um, there are, uh, you know, in the, in the past few crises on Greece, on Ukraine, on the migrant crisis, uh, the, council, the European Council claims that they have brought the solutions and Parliament has only complicated things. So that is a true, uh, a proper institutional <laughs> conflict and fight. The other thing is... Um, that I guess uh, the person of Manfred Weber, who is uh, the leader of the biggest group here in this house and has a kind of natural uh, first go maybe at finding a majority for him in this house, is of course an easy target because he's not been a uh, prime minister, he's not been a minister. Is it a problem that he's not French or that, that he is German? I wouldn't speculate I mean, about, uh, about, about that, but uh, it would be for sure easier. Uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll go as far as that if Manfred Weber uh, happened to be a French person indeed. <laughs> OK, and we were talking, you know, the, the idea in 2014 was to make the process more democratic. So by if this process is indeed abandoned, is that making it less democratic? I'll ask you that. I'm skeptical about the extent to which European citizens understand the Switzerland-Kandidat process uh, and are vested in it in any particular way. Uh, partially because the names of the Spitzenkandidat do not appear on the top of their lists. And also, um, it would make sense for a citizen to, to think about the process to, to say, oh, we are voting for the European Parliament. Mm. Oh, this candidate, it must be the candidate for the president of the European Parliament rather than for a different European institution. Mm. Um, so I think that the inherently confusing nature of the Spitzenkandidat process uh, is something that doesn't feel fully democratic. I understand that it is moving more so in a way that there is more oversight into the process. Uh, but uh, in a moment, uh, if Europe is asking if the European institutions are asking for citizens to really care about the bureaucracy, to care about the process, and it's so confusing, it's confusing I'm not sure yeah. it's helpful. Okay, but, but I mean, I, 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 I think uh, uh, Macron complains quite properly that it's a bit f uh, fictive if you only have the Spitzen uh, candidate as uh, champions of the campaign, but you haven't got a transnational uh, list for yes. the European mm -hmm. uh, Parliament. I think if you had, it would make every sense, it would, it would, it would clarify the thing for everyone. And I hope that uh, President Macron will exploit the fact that the Spitzen candidate thing hasn't gone awfully well this time to... Uh, uh, bolster the chances that we get transnational uh, It doesn't mean it's uh, dead for good. Transnational 2024. Right. No, no. I mean, I think one has to thank the Spitzen candidate for their efforts, for yeah. having made a big effort in the campaign, but to uh, confess that it hasn't really worked. Mm. OK, so what, what are you looking out for tonight? What do you think is going to come out of it, if anything? I would expect... Um, the leaders tonight to issue a statement, a rather, uh, maybe we would call it lame statement, to say that now Donald Tusk is going to talk to different stakeholders, or however you call it, uh, to lead the casting uh, for, uh, the next, for, the, for the next holders of the top jobs in the mm. European Union. Um, so I would expect them uh, primarily to avoid uh, an open split between them, because that has always been the one thing that everybody yeah. could agree on uh, in the European Council, that they are not fighting on open stage. So uh, to avoid that, I think the outcome must be rather modest. Uh, mm -hmm. But still, uh, going along uh, Parliament's wishes of this morning, uh, as, as soon as Donald Tusk is appointed or is mandated, uh, you know, to talk to other people involved in this process, and that has necessarily to involve the European uh, Parliament. It's somehow, it's somehow I mean, I, safe. Yeah. Okay, I think they've got to try to increase the pool of uh, c c candidates. You know, the... the Not just the German and the French that's uh, right. choices. That's right. The, the r r r recruitment from a whole lot of mm. uh, people who are of the uh, calibre that we need mm -hmm. and who have had the experience. And, indeed, it isn't only the presence of the uh, Commission, but these other uh, positions, including some that haven't been thought of yet, like, for instance, Treasury Secretary right. of the European Union. That would be a very good plum uh, 
position to hold. But, you know, for sure, tonight, uh, the, the spotlight is on the kind of compromise that is going to come out mm -hmm. between Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron. Can't deny that these two are still the main characters uh, of the summit. So uh, let's, uh, get, let's join uh, Sandro Gozzi now for a little bit more insight. He's an Italian MEP-elect for Amarche, that's Emmanuel Macron's uh, party, and he's uh, joining me now live from Paris. Uh, thanks uh, very much uh, there for joining us. So, Emmanuel Macron, do you think that he is just uh, rocking the boat a little bit too much on this issue? Well, I mean, uh, the, our position, after all, has already been very well explained by my friend Andrew Duff. Uh, the Spitzenkandidaten process uh, hasn't worked. Hasn't, there wasn't a clear public awareness about that in these elections. Uh, the um, landscape is very fragmented, and uh, the process is ba has been based about the contradiction. Uh, Manfred Weber and, and others rejected our proposal. It was my proposal in 2016 in the Council to introduce transnational lists after Brexit. They rejected this, and then they want to uh, have a sort of automatic decision about the speech and candidate. If we had, uh, we, had, we had had this transnational list with a clear number one directly voted by the citizens, certainly uh, Macron and, and ourselves, uh, we were, would have supported that process. But today, Today's situation is totally different. Yeah, there I mean, is a fragmented wait till, parliament. We can wait till the next election to have those transnational lists, maybe. But this is the situation we are in now. Why the can't Macron, but why can Macron just the, back this uh, uh, for now at the moment, just to, you know, to, would, to facilitate the process? Is it simply because if he backs this, this is not beneficial to your party, Amash, at the, that's be, that being the bottom line? No. If you let me ask, answer, okay. I tell you why no to your, to your question. Uh, we need to find a woman or a man which is able to gather the largest majority possible in the European Parliament. And Manfred Weber is not able to do that. We need a man or a woman who is able to embody our push for European renewal and is able to commit to our, to our political priorities around which to refound Europe, starting from trans ecological transition and rule of law. And Manfred Weber is not the right man for this either. So we need to work. We need first to uh, set down the criteria. And this is uh, certainly uh, the first two criteria are to get uh, the largest majority as possible in the council and the parliament. And the second criteria is which, uh, around which political priorities we can build up a compromise. This okay. is our position. Okay. And I think that's the best position for Europe as such. Mr. Sanchez, can you give us a name then? What is the best compromise? Um, Mr. Gosi, what is the best compromise? No, I don't have a name to give you to, 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 tonight, <laughs> but I'm sure that there are, there are um, potential candidates or even candidates we haven't heard of that could, could, that could make an excellent job. But uh, as you said, today and tomorrow is the, are the days of method and criteria and not of names. Okay, thank you very much, Sandro Gossi, their Italian MEP elected Amash party. All right, now, Pedro Sanchez, he's, he's another uh, European leader trying to exert his influence. The Spanish uh, prime minister, he's expected to sit down with Angela Merkel today ahead of the summit. And the tete-a-tete -tete comes one day after Mr. Sanchez met with French President Emmanuel Macron. This is a fresh uh, off a significant uh, victory over the weekend as a socialist placed first in the EU election. So you, here we have another leader, so the socialist leader in, in Spain. What kind of role is he going to play here? What does he add to this dynamic here? I think Pedro Sanchez is clearly the most powerful socialist leader in the European Council, leader of a big country. Uh, uh, he, won, he won elections, as you said, just a few weeks ago. Uh, he, of course, has yet to form a government, so uh, it's not that he is uh, at, the, at the height of his power already. But still, he will be the kind of informal appointment for uh, the other socialist leaders in council to see uh, what they could live with, what they could go for, uh, and where compromises might arise in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this situation, where we have, uh, indeed, Macron and Merkel, but also, of course, other leaders around the table. Sure, but both of them trying to get, I guess, get him on side. So uh, what, what do you think is the direction Sanchez is looking at? Uh, Sanchez is interested in the, progress, in the progressive agenda. Okay. Um, and uh, he is interested, of course, in pushing for uh, Timmermans uh, in various ways and of Spanish course. candidates also for high positions. Uh, what's interesting tonight at the summit will be to see to what extent will this not be the EPP show. 
um, there are very charismatic candidates uh, from the other parties that have grown. Uh, there you see the Liberals rise, the Greens rise uh, in this election. Uh, and so we'll see where the traction is on uh, some uh, on those parties as well as on the socialists who in various places in, in, in Spain, uh, in the Netherlands, really had a tremendous showing. Um, and we will... We will see whether there is room for um, one of them to take the Spitzen role or something yeah. else. Senior. So what about the role of the leaders like Matteo Salvini or Viktor Orban? What, well, what role will they be playing tonight? <laughs> well, I should expect them to be quite quiet. because you know? Because they aren't able to speak on behalf of a majority in the European Council. And if we're just having a... A, uh, a preoccupied by people, that's a mistake. We're also thinking about programmes. Mm -hmm. And he here we need a progressive uh, pro-EU mm -hmm. programme for, for the Commission over the next number of years. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that the majority of the Prime Ministers and the Chancellors also who are there will be more interested in the content of what on earth is going to be uh, that we're going to be up to in the mm -hmm. next number of years, and not exclusively on the uh, people in charge. And just very quickly, Florian, Angela Merkel's power um, is it diminished? Does she have any moves left? I mean, well, that's uh, one very exciting question because we're going to see that after tonight. Mm, ah, so the answer will come after tonight. <laughs> yes. Okay, coming up on Raw Politics, should political commentators on YouTube be regulated? And why Angela Merkel's successor is floating this very idea? Plus, see you in September. Sebastian Kurtz reigns defiant after he and his government lose a no-confidence vote. That is coming up after the break. Welcome back to the program. Now, at the age of just 32, he is now the youngest ex-chancellor in history. <laughs> Sebastian Kurz and his entire government lost a confidence vote after a political scandal caused by a secret video, the so-called Ibiza Gate affair. Well, it was the first time an Austrian chancellor or government has lost a no-confidence vote since 1945. Finance Minister and Vice-Chancellor Hatwig Lofer has been appointed as the interim chancellor until a snap election in September. But uh, Mr. Kurtz, he made a defiant statement on the steps of the Parliament building, insisting that his political career was not over. Wir werden um die Unterstützung der Bevölkerung werben, denn heute hat das Parlament entschieden, aber am Ende des Tages im September, da entscheidet in einer Demokratie das Volk und darauf freue ich mich. Vielen Dank für Ihre Unterstützung. And joining us now to unpick this is uh, Oliver Grimm. He is the Brussels correspondent at the Austrian daily newspaper Die Press. And still me, Florian Eder from Politico Europe and Christine Berzina from the German, German Marshall Fund. Okay, I will ask you, Oliver, he seems really confident that this is not the end of his career. Is it not the end of his career? Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, mm. the, the, the course of events that led to uh, that vote yesterday is just perfect for him. Uh, what you didn't show there is that... Um, his own party organized a public viewing, uh, sort of a huge screen at their own party uh, academy with about a thousand party faithful who watched that. There was beer, there was drinking, there was eating, there was singing Stand Up for Sebastian to the tune of Go West from the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> so uh, ever since the video was published, Kurz has been in campaign mode. And there are plenty of people outside his party who actually take that very badly. They say he should have reacted as a chancellor, as the prime minister for all Austrians, mm. uh, and not use that immediately as a, as a campaign pitch for, for September, for the new elections. And give it a polls now. I mean, it seems he's going to do mm. well in the elections in September. Yes. Is, that, is that the prediction as well? He did very well in the, in the European election this Sunday, sure. uh, coming by far first. Uh, and he, uh, he now will engage in a kind of uh, uh, political entrepreneurship. Uh, mm. He did not go back to, the, to Parliament, to the Nationalrat. Uh, but we'll stay out of, uh, out of any mandate uh, for the next month. So to be a you know, campaigner, full-time campaigner, uh, which is, by the way, a similar thing that he did last time around when he uh, broke the coalition with the with Social Democrats uh, to get out of the whole system and campaign mm -hmm. uh, only to become the biggest party afterwards. So I would uh, expect mm. a, a, yeah. a really exciting <laughs> campaign in Austria over the summer. So this, he, really, he really took advantage of this scandal to, to use in his favour. But what about then the far-right party that he was in a coalition with? Is that the end of that is that is that the lesson learned I think the Important lesson for them I think the lessons learned are actually far more on the center right mm -hmm. uh, and various parties who are trying to be working and thinking about forming coalitions with the far right across Europe uh, if Kurtz lands on his feet in the fall uh, 
may be, but it's following a very tumultuous uh, time that doesn't necessarily bode well for all parties everywhere. Um, if you work with the far right, uh, as, as he did, and, and, and as the Staka case showed, you don't know what comes next. Uh, you don't know at which point you're going to fizzle out. You don't know at which point you're going to have to be a phoenix or rise from the ashes. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead, I think uh, the courts either could be a shining example or a tremendous cautionary tale uh, mm -hmm. for Europeans about what happens can, uh, in these new coalitions. And can we have a gauge of where the, the far right party stands now in terms of how people uh, see this whole scandal now, now, now that it's been a week since <clears throat> it broke? Well, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the core of the, of the FPÖ held. Uh, they had a score of about, I think, 18%. They lost about three percentage points, which is almost nothing, given the, the sheer scale of, of the revelations we saw there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and acquaintance of mine is a very astute observer of politics said, the FPÖ today is what the Social Democrats used to be, mm -hmm. which is a very disciplined, ideologically, clearly oriented party of followers. It's not simply a protest party anymore, where you know, if you want to you know, take your rage out at the governing coalition, you're simply going to vote for them as a, as a sign of protest. This is a party of followers, of believers. And I think if people think that, that by getting rid of Kurz now and by publishing the video, we're going to get rid of the problem on the far right in Austria, they're, they're, they're very, very deluded. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just, uh, I'm also interested in the dynamic here in Brussels. Without uh, Sebastian Kurz uh, in the council, what, would, would that change anything? Well, he's, of course, a very ardent defender of the Spitzenkandidaten yeah, process exactly. and of Andrew Weber himself. Uh, I think what we saw out of the, the pre-summit of the EPP, uh, of the EPP heads of uh, state and government, is that they, uh, you know, the, the, the ranks held. So uh, everybody spoke in favor of both the process and the candidate. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much different it will make tonight that Kurz is not there. Okay, with this, with this finance minister in, in tow mm -hmm. there, I mean, re representing him now. Okay, so what about, um, I, want, I'm, I want to flesh out what you talk about when you talk about the lessons learned here. So yes, yes, we are about to find out whether or not um, working with the far right is, um, is, is a good thing or not. But here, when you see the parliament, it has, you know, it is fragmented, that's the word being used, or more representative. They will have to learn to work with those different groups. Do you think that that lesson is going to carry over to this parliament? I think learning how to work with versus uh, jumping in bed with are slightly different questions. Okay. Um, and I think when you look at the fragmented result of the past parliament uh, elections, uh, it's not so much that you will now absolutely have to get in bed with uh, the extremist. The fragmentation is also in the middle. Uh, and it's really a, a very productive moment to talk to, to, to have a more liberal, a more green uh, voice in addition to an SND and EPP uh, voice on politics. And so I think it will be much more a time for compromise. And a time for uh, reinvention uh, and creativity, but not necessarily for uh, for giving up some certain principles uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and trying to ameliorate uh, the extremists. And I, and I and think I, we should be very very careful about saying that fragmentation will necessarily mean well, just to be winning for the extremes. Okay, just to pick up on that word, because we did have some MEPs who were saying, okay, why is everybody labeling us a certain term or not? But mm. in the end, it, it does boil down to mm. how you are able to work uh, with people on, on less of the center. Okay, now, Austria, though, isn't the only country in Europe who is struggling to deal with corruption. Because over in Romania, one of its top politicians has been thrown in jail after he lost his appeal. Let's take a look. pentru Partidul Social Democrat, condamnarea președintelui în funcție reprezintă un moment dificil, așa cum a reprezentat pentru orice partid. Sentenced in June, but allowed to remain free pending appeal. Luck for Romania's political powerhouse, Livio Dragnea, has finally run out. Escorted to prison, he was met with cries of thief from protesters as the country's Supreme Court sided with a lower court in a final ruling and condemned him to three and a half years behind bars for corruption. Widely seen as Romania's most powerful politician, Mr. Dragnea was a central figure in the government's push for controversial judicial reforms, which sparked a fierce political standoff with Brussels and mass protests across the country. It was the second blow for the group's chief. His ruling Social Democratic Party suffered decisive losses in European elections.
Yeah, another fascinating political drama. Florian, is this good for the Romanian justice system or is there, or is there more to the story? I think there's, uh, it is good for the European justice system because it's not only uh, uh, one person responsible for uh, the so-called reforms now being in jail. Uh, <clears throat> the, the governing uh, Social Democratic Party also lost a referendum on these uh, judicial reforms on, on Sunday, uh, which is probably more important than... Uh, than uh, the other story. Okay, and as Europe will look at this as, oh, Romania on the right track? I think so. And I think those people who consider the former Warsaw Pact countries as lost cases that are unable to build up thriving civil societies mm -hmm. and you stand up for the rule of law and so forth, I think yep. after that piece of news, they should eat big slices of humble pie. There's a, there's a very thriving civil society in Romania, and basically the big winner of the European elections there is a, is a, is a, is a liberal movement for transparency that emerged as, I think, the second biggest party in the elections. Right. Yeah. And so it shows that the process works there. OK. All right. Let's leave it at that. Because coming up on Raw Politics, uh, political commentators on YouTube wield a lot of influence. Angela Merkel's successor wants to open up a debate about whether they should be reined in in Germany. That debate is up next. Welcome back to the program. Now, blue-haired German YouTuber, he's at the center of a growing political debate in Germany. At issue, whether so-called influencers who share political views should be regulated before elections. Well, Alex Morgan and our team in the Cube have been following in this story. Alex, what is this all about? Well, Tessa, we know, of course, you're a huge YouTube fan, aren't we? Have to tear you away from YouTube most days. But look, I mean, even if, say, a vast majority of slightly older people aren't, younger people certainly Ah, so what is this all about? And who are these people, you might be asking? Well, this is Rezo. You were referencing him there, known for his distinctive blue hair. He's a well-known German YouTuber. And ahead of these elections, he put out a video saying young people should abandon the mainstream CDU and other parties and vote for green issues. Then, along with 90-plus other YouTube personalities who put their faces and their names to his campaign, he put out another video saying, vote green. Do not vote for the mainstream parties. And what happened on election night? Well, the story, wasn't it? It was that green wave. Remember this? This became a meme. We brought it to you on election nights. The greens going off the chart in Germany. Now, look, it's hard. It's impossible to say if a YouTube video had anything to do with this. But still, the mainstream parties were left with, you know, a bit of an existential challenge here, thinking about how they can survive in this era. And it was in that debate that Anna Gret kramp karrenbauer otherwise known as AKK, the woman who's the heir apparent to Angela Merkel, said this to reporters. She said about this YouTube campaign, she said, well, look, if 70 newspapers got together and said, don't vote CDU or SPD, we'd be having a conversation about whether that's political propaganda or influencing. Saying there, we should have a conversation about the role influencers and YouTubers have. Now, those comments, they were taken as a call for censorship. And I can tell you, this has gone big in Germany. It is trending. Let's just bring you up some of the things that are trending. One hashtag calling for AKK to resign. This tweet here saying, obviously, it's time for some of us to move on. Other ones calling this AKK gate getting a lot of reaction. Indeed, um, if we bring you up what the um, European Centre for Press and Media Freedom said to us about these comments, it, saying to us here at Euronews, they said, from our point of view, politicians should not try to limit freedom of expression. They should guarantee a maximum of diverse and pluralistic sources. So the idea here is that rather than talking about regulation or rules on what influencers can say, they should be encouraging more and more influencers to take part. Now, look, for her part, Annegret kramp karrenbauer AKK, has tweeted to say, it's absurd to take my comments as calling for censorship. She says here, no, I am calling for a conversation about electoral rules. How in the uh, digital age can we think about moving forward with rules for the analog age, if you like, is really where she's going. But look, you can see, can't you, Tessa, the strength of feeling and the fact that, yes, there must be a fear in mainstream party headquarters that the faces of young people, which many politicians probably can't name, could theoretically change or get a lot of young people's minds made up on key issues. It's certainly a question for 2019 and one that's got uh, Anna Kramp-Karrenbauer uh, Kramp in hot water in Germany.
All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and Eric team in the Cube. And joining us in the studio now for more are Samuel Stolton. He's a tech and digital affairs journalist from Eractive. Also joining us, Olivia West, a tech and competition expert from BCW. And back from the summit, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor here. Okay, I'll start with you, Olivia. Just how influential are these YouTubers? Well, I think we've seen they're extremely influential. The question is, is there anything wrong with that? And I think my take is, yes, we should be having the conversation. The conversation used to be very clear for everybody. Rules apply to acts, but not to ideas and opinions. This very clear conversation that probably everybody agrees on has now been blurred. Why? Because suddenly, Russian influencers started using Facebook ads to try to influence people. Now there's confusion. Oh my God, is what the YouTuber did actually like what the Russians are doing with Facebook? Or is what the YouTuber did something good that we want to promote? I, this, think, I, think, is, I think there is a difference. Okay. I think there is a difference because ultimately, um, you know, the internet is not like other mediums and we accept that. You know, it's a hell of a lot freer and it's unregulated space. But there is a question, and this is a question about, you know, freedom of speech, but it's also a question about transparency. Mm -hmm. That's and, the ticket. And, but, but, but we're broadcasting on television. Now, we oh. are regulated. Now, that does not mean that there are curbs to freedom of opinion or freedom of expression, but what it does mean is that uh, there are, you have to act within a certain parameters. Mm -hmm. And it's the same whether you want to broadcast on TV, it's the same if you want to publish in newspapers. And I think all AKK is saying is, well, if you want to essentially broadcast on the internet, why is that allowed to be the Wild West where there are not these parameters? And I think to say that, oh, that means you're kind of curbing freedom of speech is not true, because no-one would say that of but, this medium. I think, we, I think we need okay. to take a step back, firstly, and just realise that, actually, to have 70-plus young people on YouTube with such a large audience getting involved in modern political debate is a wonderful thing to happen. And we shouldn't be talking about how to stifle you know, freedom of expression or freedom of opinions and such things like that. We should be talking about ways in which we could let them manifest further and encourage younger people to get more involved in the modern political debate. Yeah, because it's, it's clearly a different world. It's a different kind of medium. And indeed, the YouTubers would say, well, we are just ordinary people. We can say what we want. It's an, it's an opinion. But on the other hand, they are on a platform that's producing content. So to the point of AKK, why aren't you regulating content produced on this platform? But, because you can say, I'm just an ordinary person but you are producing a show, a YouTube show. Well, they're, well, they're not producing content for malicious means. They're not looking sure, like the Russian not... Internet Research Agency are directly well, but, 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 to but isn't... influence the European election. Yeah, but, we, but, but the problem in part in this is that we don't know that. So how, how do we know that they're not doing it for malicious means? There's no transparency. We don't know potentially who is behind... So I accept that there is a person sat in front of a camera broadcasting YouTube. We don't know who's behind them. We don't know. There could be foreign forces. I'm not suggesting not, in any but, case but we, we that in, in what's happened in Germany or indeed elsewhere that there is, but clearly there could be. And I've got no doubt you look at the United States, uh, the role the big lobby... Not, not, not countries, but lobbyists have in influencing influencers. So, but I, think I mean, look that, at I Instagram. Think that's, part, and Darren, I think that's part of the aim behind the Code of uh, Practice Against Disinformation, which the Commission announced at the end of last year. Of course, this is a voluntary self-regulatory framework, but at the same time, it does help to increase transparency. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to take these things one step at a time. Talking about regulation at this early stage could be potentially dangerous further down the line. OK. I, ahead, I'd like Lydia. to say, I think it's a question of public perception. Mm -hmm. The public perceives that while both traditional media and digital media have the same two motivations, what are they? Fuel the debate and make some money, right? I think public perception is that traditional media might care more about making money than about the debate. They think maybe some of these new tech players, Google, Facebook, they might also care a little bit more about making money Mm -hmm. than the debate. But people who are the YouTubers, public perception is, hey, these guys probably care more about the debate than making money. Now, the reality is, we don't that's know. way too simplistic. We don't, we don't know. We and, have to take a closer look. I think, and I'd like okay. to finish one more thing. Okay. If that's the reality, you know, the truth is, we need more 
freedom of expression so we can figure this stuff out. Stop stifling people for trying to figure it out. No one has the answers to these questions. How are we going to get the answers that we need for the next generation? I mean, I think for, for young people, the beauty of the internet is, well, the freedom that's, that they see that exists there, which, you know, is, is up for debate now. But I, that's why I asked you why, how influential are YouTubers? It's because... I think, you know, when, when young people, there are a lot of young people who might get their information and might get their opinion from these people with millions of followers. If, for example, there's, uh, there is someone who gave, let's say, faulty uh, advice and people followed it and it harmed their health. If a doctor did that because they're, they're licensed... Which we see all the time on the, the internet. Rules, Look at the anti-vax movement. Right, so what about if you were a normal person? Yes, this is my opinion. It could be absolutely wrong and it's not regulated because it's my opinion as well. But it causes harm or it causes... I think that's you know, a slightly so... different issue when okay. we're talking about people's welfare okay. and people's health. I mean, this is... Uh, what these YouTubers did was to encourage people to participate in the wider political debate. And I but think... they did say, don't vote for this, don't vote for that, and don't vote for this. They did, that's but at the end it's of the day, opinion. people okay. are free to make their own right. choices. But, but, but you know? also, and... are there not parallels, though, with Instagram influencers? Which is, a couple of years ago, we weren't entirely sure when... Instagram influencers, which we didn't use at the time, but famous people on Instagram, were essentially had products and were flogging them. And they've now, Instagram had to react to that and essentially they, because mm -hmm. public perception has changed, people have had to uh, be made aware of when they're now selling products. And I think what all I would suggest about YouTubers, great that they're encouraging people to sure. take part in politics, great that they're expressing their views, but there needs to be an element of transparency that if there is someone behind them, if there's a lobbying group, a foreign country, a, an interested part, that they, there has to be a mechanism so we're in which there is some, some yeah. transparency. Because okay. freedom of thought is great, but okay. if it's being boosted by potentially malicious forces, we need to know about it. And all also, right. just to Go close ahead, on Sam. one last point, <laughs> I, don't, I think we can all agree on AKK wouldn't have made these comments if the this CCU sure. would yeah. have sure. been sure. successful in the exactly. elections. That's the bottom There's line. There's also here. that question there. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. Motivation. And coming up on Raw Politics, what do you think? Should political commentators and YouTube face regulation? We want to hear your opinion on this topic. So your call is coming up at 7 p.m. at local time, Brussels time. The contact information, there it is on your screen. You can call us at 00 800 to get in on the debate, use the hashtag raw politics. Our lines are opening after the break. Pick up the phone, it's free. Give us a call. Is the green wave unstoppable? Is it present in Italy? It should be unstoppable. All the discussion about the European elections in Italy has been completely polarized. On migration. Why do we focus on a single issue? Why do we assume political parties can only cope with a single issue? Even young generation here in Italy are not really interested in uh, environmental uh, topics. Why are they not interested? They're concentrating on paying their bills. When you pay your bills, the environment is not a big issue for you. <laughs> Welcome back. So those were last night's highlights on your call, and we're doing it all over again tonight. So you can tune in at 7 p.m. Brussels time, 6 p.m. if you're in the U.K. or in Ireland. And our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, he will be hosting that tonight. And they, he will be joined by Livia West from BCW Global, who's with us now, and also with us, Sam Stolton for Euractive. So last night you had a lot of Italian callers that were just noticing. So we did, which was really <laughs> interesting on the fact that green issues weren't being brought up, because we've been mentioning green waves a lot. And actually, they, all these callers were saying, interestingly, that the mainstream media, TV, and the narrative there was being dominated uh, by migration in the economy, and green issues weren't, and so, so it wasn't reflected with voters. So that was last night. Tonight, uh, we're carrying on with kind of election themes and who's leading Europe. Uh, and what you think of the discussion we've just been having about YouTubers... Even during the break. <laughs> even during the break. Let's have a look at the hot topics tonight. The race to replace Jean-Claude Juncker is on, and Europe's leaders tonight are gathering to decide who they want to be the next Commission president. Last time round, it went to the League candidate from the party who won the most seats in the parliamentary elections. In this case, it would be the EPP's Manfred Weber. Only a person can be elected, and that must be a Spitzenkandidat. But some want that to be a one-off, and are now favouring smaller parties. And others say voters should have a direct say. So how should the EU's most powerful politician be chosen? Commission presidents appointed or elected? 
When the man who will play a huge role in Brussels' power struggle is France's Emmanuel Macron. Despite losing to Marine Le Pen, his centrist en marche MEPs could be the kingmakers, joining the Liberal supergroup in the newly fragmented European Parliament. With Angela Merkel's influence fading, the French president has positioned himself as Europe's most powerful leader in the European Council. And tonight, you can be sure he'll have his say about who he thinks should be the Commission president. What do you think? Does Emmanuel Macron have too much influence? Speaking of influencers, they're at the centre of a political storm in Berlin. With Angela Merkel's successor, Annegret kramp kangenbauer calls for debate on the regulation of political views online during this campaign. We see the CDU and also a bit of SPD and a bit of AfD, but primarily we see the CDU. It comes after the German YouTube star Rezo released this video, urging voters to punish the governing coalition for what he sees as a lack of action on climate change. 70 other prominent German YouTubers then echoed Rezo's call in a support video viewed more than 3 million times. Some say it's an attempt to rein in political commentary on YouTube and it amounts to censorship. What do you think? Should political YouTubers be regulated? Come on Europe, have your say. Commission president appointed or elected? Does Emmanuel Macron have too much influence? And what do you think? Should political YouTubers be regulated? And you know what to do, uh, pick up the phone. It is free. We really want to hear from you tonight. Uh, it is 00800 333 700 uh, 2. No reason not to call in if you've got a view on any of those topics. Email us at rawpoll at euronews.com. Hashtag, if you are on the interweb, uh, on Twitter or Facebook using hashtag raw politics, or indeed on Skype, raw politics is the handle. Indeed, so we are, waiting. we are waiting for you. OK, so let's talk about... Um, Emmanuel Macron tonight, he's uh, in, in Brussels. So does Emmanuel Macron have too much influence, Sam? What do you think? Well, it depends on many, how many friends he can make in the next <laughs> you know, few hours or so. He's been doing the rounds today. Um, we'll see later on tonight. And um, they're going to have some discussions. The talks last night with Sanchez apparently went relatively well. And uh, he's got Sanchez's support, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Is he, he, he's de he definitely is not as strong as Merkel in the council. Is he not? No. But I think um, it depends, as I say, on how many uh, alliances he can form uh, for his Even Liberal Even with front. Merkel's weakened position somewhat. Yeah, no. I, th I okay. think she still has a lot of respect from other leaders. And, I mean, you know, Germany, of course, when we're talking of quality majority voting, mm -hmm. um, she still has a lot of uh, well, uh, according authority to, in According to reports well. today, AKK, who's got lots of mentions of this programme thus far tonight, <laughs> has performed so badly because, ultimately, she led the CDU campaign in Germany where mm -hmm. they lost eight percentage points, has performed so badly that Merkel has essentially unresigned in some regards today and is suggesting that she definitely, definitely, definitely does want to do a full term up until, I think, 2021. 2021. Yeah. So, in those regards, uh, you know, she still is uh, the most powerful player in Europe, but Manuel Macron uh, is clearly trying to buy, build this kind of liberal left alliance, determined to stop the EPP ruling the roost. Can he do it? He annoys yeah. an awful lot of people. He does. So, from a from a perception point of view, is he, is he still the emperor of Europe? I think people perceive that he has a lot of power. I think people are not sure how much power does he have versus the German side. You know, mm -hmm. they're trying to figure that out. I think the question is: it too much power that Macron has? What what is the motivation that he has? Does he want to truly bring forth freedom of ideas so we can find the best solutions? Or does he really want to just solidify his own power because he wants to make more money or mm. have his friends make more money? Mm -hmm. If we believe Macron wants to put forth ideas, then we should say he doesn't have too much power. If we think so, his motivation is to so make we'll money... So we'll have to watch him, watch him tonight. And if you have an opinion on what we're talking about here, don't forget that to join us on your call after this program. You can call us. So the number is 00800 333 002, or you can write to us, rawpoll at euronews.com. And on social media, everywhere on social media, in fact, you can use uh, the hashtag rawpolitics, and you can look for us on Skype. So do join the debate. We love having and you. you can watch on YouTube. Yes, you can. OK, <laughs> so tonight's a raw moment, a budding new friendship in Vienna. That's where the UN is meeting for the Austrian World Summit aimed at climate protection. Let's take a look. Yeah. From Mission of the World Climate Summit in Wien, I see you at the Hilton Platz. You're going to have an international cute dog with thousands of people coming to guy, hearing music and all this stuff. You're going to have a great time. So 
be there. Great and, and Arnold buddies there. I know. Uh, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, that he's become this kind of campaigner for uh, climate, or uh, against climate change, I should say. Well, and Greta, potentially the greatest influencer in this election, potentially. Indeed. She's so the motivation stars behind there the green together. Wing. Okay, so again, we'd love to hear your views. So do call in after this program on your call and use the hashtag RawPolitics. Tell us your comments and what you think on everything we talk about. Thank you for watching and see you in a few minutes.